Uh, welcome everybody to the CLEX seminar series. My name is Ailey Gallant um, and I'm a CI at Monash University um, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. It's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Alain Prata from the Bureau of Meteorology. Alain is a senior principal research scientist where he leads the radar science and now casting team in the science and innovation group. Uh, so Alain and his team use radars at different frequencies on different platforms. So that's ground, ship, aircraft and satellite in order to better understand cloud and convective processes. And so this better understanding of clouds and convection is then exploited to evaluate and improve both satellite products and the representation of clouds and convection in numerical weather prediction and climate models. Alain is also uh, developing an innovative radar based now casting technique for wind and hail. So Elaine is very accomplished. He's co-authored two book chapters and over 150 peer-reviewed publications. He's originally from France, where he was working at uh, CNRNS, uh, which is the equivalent to Australia's CSIRO. He came to uh, the Bureau of Meteorology to work on a project uh, for just a year, I think it was, or for three years, sorry. Um, went back to France, decided he loved it here and came back permanently. And I am also told, I have it on very good authority, that Alain is the reigning champion of the uh, Bureau of Meteorology Social Cup baking competition with his French pastries. <laughs> so, a good man to know. But Alain, thank you. I'll throw it over to you. We'll hear from you for about 45 minutes. If people have questions during, uh, during the talk, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to the questions at the very end. Okay, thank you, Alain. Yeah, I guess the cake competition is probably my biggest achievement here. But I will try to talk about something else today. Uh, but if you need any recipe, don't hesitate. Uh, yeah, I, I want to describe today uh, really a team effort that uh, we are all working on in my team, which is uh, around uh, developing new and hopefully innovative radar-based now casting techniques. Uh, and, and really the purpose here is to is for the general public first, because uh, this is funded by uh, what is called the Public Services Transformation Program in the Bureau. And this program aims at uh, changing the way we, 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 we interact and, uh, and, and inform the general public about uh, imminent uh, high impact weather. Uh, but of course, uh, when you do that, uh, businesses should be interested in the outcomes of that work. So I, I just want to first acknowledge my team. So it's Joshua, all the names are here. Joshua, Valentin, Mark, Jaya, Carlos, and Susan. And also Jordan Brook, who's a PhD student uh, working on hail now casting with us at University of Queensland, uh, whom we are co-supervising with Joshua. Um, let's get started. So I guess uh, most of you know what we are talking about here, but uh, I thought it would be useful to describe uh, what we mean by now casting. So now casting is really the shorter term forecasting uh which means lead times trying to predict what's going to happen between now and uh, four hours ahead um and i will occasionally use the term analysis which means that that's what happened what is happening now um it, it's actually a, a big challenge to do that uh, and the reason why it's difficult to provide now casting uh, in this sort of one hour to four hour lead time is because Observations based now casting, uh, the quality of those products usually lasts up to, it depends on the application, but let's say 60 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes. We think we can go up to 90 minutes for rainfall, for instance. And on the, on the other side of the fence, you have the high resolution models. Uh, when you're trying to do now casting with high resolution models, it requires spin up time for the model to stabilize. And also, uh, you need to, 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 to have very strong data assimilation to be able to reduce that, that spin up time. So usually at the moment, for instance, uh, with our access system, the first hours of forecast are ger generally not used, not, not even written. Um, so you see that, yeah, so you can do the first hour pretty much with observations. There's a gap between one and three, four hours, and then the model takes over. And, and in terms of performance as well, I didn't put a, a slide on that, but uh, you can clearly see how one is degrading and the other one is improving. So the solution we think is to develop observations based now casting blended with high resolution models that have very rapid update cycle. So assimilating data very regularly uh, with a very good uh, DA system. Um, 
So that's sort of the long-term bureau plan, and we have written actually a project plan with Pete Steinle about that internally to, to, to promote that idea. And so today I'm going to focus only on what my team is doing at the moment, which is observations-based now casting using operational radar observations. So I will be again focusing on this first hour, one and a half hour lead. So it doesn't seem like much in terms of a lead time, but it's actually a very useful uh, window. First, if you think about the job of a forecaster, of course, you have the day plus one, day plus two, all the longer term uh, uh, idea of what uh, the weather is, is going to give us. Uh, but of course, as you get closer to when things are happening, you need very good situational awareness as a, as a forecaster. And, and, and that's what's going to help you build confidence in what you think is happening and the production of warnings that, are, that go out to the public. So that's actually an important window. That is a, it's, a, it's an integral part of the job of a forecaster. Um, of course, uh, that's how you inform the general public of uh, incoming potential weather ha related hazard in their area. And there's lots of work to try to personalize that uh, information at the Bureau to try to give, oh, that's where you're located. That's the sort of uh, hazards you're, you're going to, to face uh, in the next uh, hour or so. And of course, it's also important to inform uh, emergency services, insurance industry, aviation, uh, so that they can trigger mitigation actions to save lives and assets and prepare post even recovery. When something has happened, you need to know where it has happened, especially emergency services, so that they can really efficiently redirect their, uh, their efforts. I want to show you a glimpse of uh, what's happening at the moment in terms of the operational radar network. Uh, one of the main things that is happening is that uh, a lot of radars are being replaced with this dual polarization capability. I won't go into detail, but basically what dual polarization does for you is that it really helps with the quality control of the radar observations, which has an impact on what can be assimilated and what can't be assimilated, for instance. It gives you a really improved estimates of rainfall rates at the higher end, which is interesting, for instance, for uh, all rainfall extreme studies, uh, like, like what is being done at INCLEX or in general. And it's very good at discriminating between hail, rain hail mixture, and, and heavy rain. That's something that uh, has been a longstanding issue with the single polarization radars. Uh, in terms of the network, uh, the first effort here has been in 2017 where four of the capital cities got their radar upgraded to dual polarization. So it's existing radars that have been update, upgraded to uh, dual polarizations in Adelaide, uh, Brisbane, Melbourne, and Sydney. And now uh, you've got new CBEN dual pol radars that have been uh, installed. So it's brand new radars this time in uh, WA, especially uh, WA had been the port parent for a while uh, with radars. And uh, now they are at the top of the, of the food chain. Uh, one in Victoria, and there's new ones that are being installed as we speak. Mildura is actually already uh, installed now and operational. And there's a series of uh, privately funded um, ones uh, inland uh, in New South Wales. There's also four new ones that are going to be installed along here, uh, this coast inland again, so that it complements the coverage of the existing network between Townsville and Brisbane. So as you can see, uh, ultimately, the idea is that within a few years, maybe five, maybe 10, it will depend on funding, all of the radars uh, of the operational network are going to be uh, dual polarization. Uh, a very important thing I want to mention is it's, it's probably the least sexy of anything that we are doing, but it's probably also the most important. It's everything that relates to radar data quality. Anything you do downstream of, of uh, using radar observations will have to be done with high quality data. And uh, for this purpose, the first thing we've done in this PST project is to develop a way to not work blindly and to have a regular daily monitoring of how each of the radars of the network is going. And for that, um, that's work uh, that has been led by Valentin Louf uh, to provide uh, accurate calibration of our operational radars because it underpins all of the radar based rainfall, hail services, everything. So what's funny about it, it's sort of a fun fact, it's that it's using everything that we usually throw out, uh, which is the ground clutter, that's when the, the beam hits the ground, and the sun interferences when the sun is measured uh, inside the beam of the radar. And we also use a spaceborne radar from uh, the NASA JAXA Global Precipitation Mission uh, uh, every day. So we've got uh, this uh, tool that uh, ingests all the, the orbits that are within coverage of the radar, and for each of the radar, uh, we are um, 
diagnosing, how well it's uh, calibrated, and how well it's pointing where we think it's pointing as well, which is important. Now going on to now casting. So I will present the, what we are currently working on in terms of rainfall now casting. There's going to be one part on rainfall, one on winds, and one on hail. So um, the, the, the tool that we have been developing over the years, and, and that's work that was pioneered by Alan Seed, and is now taken over by Carlos, Mark, and Jayam. Uh, it's called STEPS, uh, and it's, what it's doing, it's producing ensemble rainfall now casting. Uh, at the moment, uh, although we have 62 operational weather radars, the radar only version of STEPS uh, is running only on four of those radars, as you can see here, and that's not by accident. It's the four dual pole radars that are covering most of the population. Uh, and it's producing uh, analysis uh, and now cast up to 90 minutes, and this is done every five minutes. And then there's the second version of STEPS, which is ingesting uh, high resolution uh, simulation from Access uh, C2 and now C3, which is the latest version. And up to recently, it was running on seven radars. Those are the colored boxes you can see here, uh, seven domains, sorry. Um, so what I'm just going to do, and so what it's doing is that it's, it's producing now casting ensemble rainfall predictions up to 12 hours lead time. So much longer than the, the radar only version, which was 90 minutes. And it's producing that every 10 minutes because the model lab puts are ingested every 10 minutes. So if you, if I toggle back and forth, uh, and if you focus on the dashed lines here, the four dashed lines, that's what we are doing now. It's going to become um, available very soon. You're going to have now cast ensemble rainfall predictions uh, from radar only for all of radars of the network. And to do that, uh, the system has been put to the cloud, uh, the AWS cloud, and is now uh, about to become uh, operational. And in terms of the STEPS and WP version, that's what you had before and that's uh, what you would have now. So I think that's a big step up. Uh, one of the underlying philosophy of the whole thing is that you try to produce national analysis, not for uh, areas where people live, but also everywhere in the country, and especially for rainfall, it's important. Some assets are not where people live and so on. And uh, this is one way as well to better serve uh, both the forecasters and, and, and businesses is to provide the simplest product. And that's why uh, my team has been working on producing those national mosaics, which are using uh, all the radars, but gridded over a national mosaic, which you can see here. So it's just, an, if you, I don't know if you can see, but it's an animation actually. Uh, the first uh, part of the animation is the truth, which is called rainfields. That's our rainfall analysis. Uh, and then there's the uh, advection uh, done by the steps technique. Um, there's been a lot of work um, uh, and, and a lot of work done on verification as well. We had a first version of this called steps, um, steps one. And then there's been a community version developed by the international community called Pi Steps. And so that's sort of the benchmark you want to beat with anything you do to improve uh, these uh, steps. And so we've redeveloped the whole core of the steps technique. It's there as I will uh, not highlight here because I forgot to put a slide, but that's okay. And uh, in terms of um, runtime as well, uh, one downside of uh, steps one was that it was running in something like three minutes. And now in 20 seconds, you can do all the radars uh, and before you only had seven radars. So as you can see, there's, there's also this dimension when you work operationally, you need to, to, to produce efficient codes as well. This is one uh, verification, extensive, uh, probably the most extensive, extensive verification that has been ever done on steps. This is using six months of um, ensemble now casting. Uh, so it's a bit of a complicated plot, but the main message here is that on the x-axis, you've got the lead time from 10 to 90. So you can see that this and, and the, the plot is showing the rock area, which is one, number one, and at the very least over 0.7, which is defined here as acceptable. And so, uh, and, and the different uh, colors here are for different um, uh, threshold. So you use threshold. And so as you go to the right from here to here, you're evaluating the higher end of the rainfall uh, probability distribution function. So as expected, you can see that the, 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 the quality of the prediction is degraded as you go uh, to longer lead time. 
remaining for most of the rainfall uh, thresholds is still remaining above the acceptable uh, level. It was not like that for steps one. It was dropping dramatically after 60 minutes. So that has been probably one of the main uh, improvements that uh, uh, Carlos and Mark and Jaya have, have brought to that technique. Uh, and I just want to mention, I was talking and, and making a pitch for dual pole uh, observations because uh, all this uh, steps thing is actually single polarization at the moment. Uh, we are working on improving the rainfall analysis using dual pole observations. That's work that Joshua and I have been doing with help from Mark and Susan. Uh, the current product is, as I said, a single polarization, but there are issues, specific issues are with higher rainfall rates. Uh, when you have a partial beam blocking, there's a mountain and only a part of the beam is going through. Uh, that, that underestimates the reflectivity and therefore underestimates the rainfall rate. So when you have this partial beam blocking by the terrain. And, and the biggest issue probably for extreme weather is when you have rain hail mixture because the single polarization that doesn't provide you any sort of information. And to illustrate that, I've selected that case, which is this high-end Brisbane hailstorm that we've been working on in 2014. Uh, that has produced over a billion of, uh, of damage uh, over Brisbane because it went to the wrong place at the right time, at the wrong time. And um, that's just here. Uh, this is range for the, from, the, from the radar. So along that cross section here that I'm showing there. So you're, you're, you're going through the main core, the main hail core. And if you were to treat reflectivity as being uh, heavy rain, you would get this, this blue uh, line here that peaks up to 70 millimeter per hour. Once you use other polarimetry variables in the retrieval, you are, not, you, you are able to discriminate between hail, rain, hail, and, 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 and heavy rain. And that's what actually the rain part of it is only that bit you can see here. So it's about, let's say, 20 millimeter, 15 millimeter per hour. So you can see the sort of overestimation you can have in those situations, which are not very common. So, so you, you wouldn't see it so much in the, in the scores that you get from such techniques. But for individual case studies, uh, and again, going back to the work of a forecaster, uh, diagnosing something like 70 millimeter per hour or 50 millimeter per hour is a big difference. So we have developed a dual pole rainfall technique at, two, at the two main frequencies of the operational network. So it's called S-band and C-band. Uh, C-band being an additional challenge because it's attenuated by heavy, heavy um, targets. And, and this, this, this is going to be transitioned to operations um, early next year. Uh, I don't know if I should stop here and, and ask if anyone has questions or I keep going and we ask questions in the end. I can uh, it's really up to you, Alain. If yeah, yeah. Has questions. Uh, we did have one question come through from Ian McAdam, actually, and he wanted to yep. know um, who's funding the, the, privately, the privately funded radars in Mildura and in New South Wales uh, and why? Yeah, I don't know the details, but more and more uh, additions to the... Um, I think it's a group of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it comes from the agriculture uh, business. Uh, I don't know the details, but I know that I think the Queensland one is also coming from agriculture. And soon there's gonna be another one uh, in Northern Territory, the, which will be funded by defense as well. The, the idea behind that is our operational radar network doesn't cover some of the specific assets that some businesses and some groups of businesses are most interested in. And that's why uh, the Bureau is, is entering into partnerships because it's a win-win situation. They pay for the radar. We use our expertise to ingest that. Uh, oh, I think we seem to have lost a line. Um, Just might wait a, a minute or two. I know he froze for a minute. If everyone can just hold tight, we'll see if we can get in touch with him and get him back online.
sorry about this, everybody. Um, if you could just hold tight, we're just going to try and get back in touch with Alain as soon as we can and um, get him back online to continue his seminar. Just hold tight. Hello, can you hear me again? Yes, we can, Alain. Good to have you uh, back. Good to have you back. I'm really sorry about that. I don't <laughs> no, know that's happened. okay. It's yeah. fine. Uh, I guess you can't see my screen anymore. That's okay. Share again. Um, this one. Share. Yeah, maybe that's because I was talking too much. <laughs> Not a problem. Thanks, everybody, for being patient. So you can see my screen again? Yes, we can. That's wonderful. Yeah, so many new Doppler radars, so many things to play with. Um, I just want to, it's not something that many people work on. Uh, so I just wanted to mention what the challenge is. Um, to get three-dimensional winds, uh, an easy way to think about it is that it's three information and you need three pieces of information to retrieve those three unknowns. And so there are two possibilities to do that. It's either you have two uh, Doppler measurements for any any grid that's sort of illustrated here, where you had this uh, research radar CP2 and this operational radar at Mount Stapleton. Those are the areas where you have two non-collinear observations. And then you can use um, the mass continuity equations with just one equation. That's three information, three unknown. You can solve the problem. Uh, it's, it's a shortcut. But uh, the, the problem is that we only have that in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, in Melbourne, we have uh, the Laverton radar, uh, a backup radar and the uh, Yarrawonga radar. So you can sort of do something with that. And in Sydney, it's, uh, it's the spoiled area. You have five radars that are, that have, that are covering a huge area. So that's uh, the only places where we can do that. But ideally, we would like to do that anywhere we can. So the other option is to use one Doppler measurement only, so isolated radar. The mass continuity equation, that's your second, uh, 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 second information. And then you need to have a strong assumption or you need to use another equation. Uh, what I'm developing at the moment, so there's this, it's, it's kind of known in the radar world, but I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's the VAD technique, velocity azimuth display. But here you have to assume that the wind, the horizontal wind components are linear. So the first order derivatives are constant, which in severe weather is sort of a huge uh, assumption that is never satisfied pretty much. But that gives you some, uh, indication of what the mesoscale divergence looks like, uh, the sort of mean vertical velocity ascent or descent, and it gives you some indication of vertical wind shear as well. So, but then there's a trick. You can use two radars, even, even if they are quite spaced apart, up to, let's say, 250 kilometers. You can use two of individual VADs in this new technique called double VAD or DVAD. And that's what I've been developing for, 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 for our uh, technique. And the additional benefit of that is that you can get rotation uh, that you can't have with a VAD. And then there's more complex techniques which use reflectivity conservation um, and, and using advection. So using two or three successive time steps, you can sort of say that uh, the Doppler measurements that you have are not collinear. So you can start playing with that to try to come up with a, with a solution. So what I want to illustrate is that uh, um, it's a, I will illustrate that later, but of course you can't expect the same thing from that sort of technique than when you have a dual, uh, dual Doppler or multi-Doppler technique. So just to give you some indication, the typical resolution that you can get with radar observations is about 1.5, 1 to 1.5 kilometer horizontally and 500 meter vertically. And the code I've developed runs in about 30 seconds. So it's, it's not the quickest, but it's still okay for operational application. 
uh, for each volumetric scan. And so, as I said, we've been developing different sorts of techniques. The multi-Doppler technique, I, I had been working on that for a very long time. Um, uh, and then the DIVAT technique is when, as I explained, if the radars are too far away from each other for multi-Doppler, but the radar, the distance between radars is, is, is still uh, within, say, two, 200, 250 kilometer. Uh, you can do something. And then there's this 3D optical flow technique that has been developed by Mark in my team that uses two successive time step. And that's what you can do, that's what you can use to get some indication of a third component that you are missing. And then I, I, the ultimate goal here is to blend all those different techniques so that you can produce in a in, in bigger region, you produce your best estimate of the three-dimensional wind. Um, and the double VAD and 3D optical flow will be used mostly as gap filling. When you have multi-doppler, you use multi-doppler, but when you don't, you, I, I will give you some illustrations of that. Uh, in terms of now casting, uh, it's going to be mostly about uh, now casting low-level winds, because uh, that's what we think we can do pretty well. And that will use this optical flow to advect high wind structures and, and, and see where we think they are going in the, in the near future. Uh, all of this, uh, we should be finished with the research uh, next month, or actually this month, because we're first, we're first of June. And uh, there's going to be a step to transition that to operations until uh, March, March, April 2022. So what you do usually at the Bureau is that you collect uh, business and, uh, and, and external stakeholders' uh, requirements for that sort of products. And so we, we've been consulting a lot of uh, um, business and uh, general public uh, oriented industries and, and we've collected all those, uh, th those requirements and I won't go into details because I'm sort of running a bit out of time. Um, so that's what it looks like, uh, just to give you an example. So on the left, that's the Sydney area where, I, as I said, you have five radars. Looks like the animation is not really starting. Oh, we'll see. Um, on the left, you have the reflectivity in color. Uh, that's a, a tornado that uh, went through uh, the Sydney airport. Uh, and uh, did a lot of damage in this uh, Kernel um, Peninsula over here. So that's sort of this very high-end uh, severe weather that uh, you want to, 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 to really uh, help uh, assess what sort of uh, incoming uh, hazard is going to, to, to affect people. And so here you've got the reflectivity, the, the arrows are the horizontal winds uh, at about 1.5 kilometer uh, height. And in the middle, you've got the vertical velocity, so updrafts and downdrafts associated with this mesocyclone that is going, that is sweeping through the, the Sydney airport. And I just want you to give you, that's another case, because I haven't done that for this case, but that's a 2014 East Coast low, where we're trying to merge all those different techniques together. And as you can see, you can really sort of provide a more mesoscale analysis of what the winds look like if you start blending those different sources of observation. So that's an illustration here. That's the sort of best coverage you can get in Australia for multi-Doppler on the left. And as you can see, that's actually not that much. And on the right, you've got what you can do by treating pairs of radars in the Sydney area. But as you can see, the flow is much more, it's, it's much smoother. So there's really, it's really to illustrate that uh, the solution here is to do blending. And that's what I'm illustrating here, where you, when you have multi-Doppler, you do multi-Doppler. And outside of that, you provide sort of the mesoscale flow that is still very helpful to analyze if uh, sea breeze is coming, for instance, in that area. I will now go to the last part, which is the hail now casting. Uh, hail now casting, the most important thing, of course, is uh, if there's one thing you need to know about uh, the importance of dual polarization is that, uh, so there's different things you measure. I won't enter into details. There's horizontal reflectivity, ZH, ZDR is a, uh, the difference between horizontally polarized and vertically polarized. And then you've got other parameters, but really hail, the, the main difference, if you just look here at reflectivities, heavy rain will go up to 55 dBZ. That's the sort of measurements you can get uh, the, the top end of heavy rain. But hail can be found at 40 dBZ and up to say 75 dBZ. So as you see there's a significant overlap between where you can have hail or where, where you can have rain. However, when you start looking at other uh, polarimetry variables like ZDR, heavy rain will have very high ZDR, but hail will have very low ZDR. And that's an illustration here from, uh, from uh, um, a display in the US, I don't remember, but um, that's reflectivity here. So you see this very strong hail core in that area, 65 plus dBZ. But look at the ZDR, it's about zero, pretty much. 
And so what it tells you is that those hailstones, they are tumbling. And so when they get bigger, uh, they look spherical. And because they are spherical, there's no difference between the horizontally and, and vertically polarized signals. Uh, so dry hail is very easy. Melting hail and rail hail mixture is a bit uh, mixed uh, between the two. And all the challenge is to, to develop dual pole hail detection techniques that will provide information on where dry hail is located and when rain hail mixture closer to the ground is located. So the Bureau, for instance, has developed uh, what we think is a more objective way of doing that using cluster-based uh, hydrometeor classification. That's work that has been done at Melbourne Uni by Gary Wen. And that's again one illustration if you focus on this gap storm, which was a high-end storm again in the Sydney area, uh, in the Brisbane area, sorry. Um, you see this core of high reflectivities and again, very low uh, differential reflectivity. And you can see that uh, our classification is able to say that's small hail around and there's cores of large hail in that area. So pretty successful. Going back to this Brisbane hailstone, that's just an eye candy to show that there's some time continuity. And if you focus on this vertical cross section that is uh, along here, you will see these dark purple areas are hail cores, dry hail cores. And if you look at the animation again, you will see that there's hail cores here descending with time and producing rain hail mixture underneath. You can even see in the flow uh, accelerations due to the, to the, the hail cores uh, reaching the ground. So it's, there's very, what I try to illustrate is the very high detail that you can get in terms of the dynamics inside the storm and uh, where hail is located. Uh, in terms of hail now casting, the, the next step you need to do is to provide hail size. So it's, it's not the hail size of individual hailstone. A radar is measuring in a volume but it's a matrix of uh, what is sort of the maximum hail size in the, in the volume sampled by the... And for that, we are just using what we think is the best available at the moment. It's the hail size discrimination algorithm that has been developing, developed by NSSL. Um, I won't go into details, but we have coded that up. Um, and so going back to the Bureau services, so that's work that's being done by Joshua mostly with uh, Valentin and I. In terms of the current products, we, it's not like winds. We are not starting with nothing. The, 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 the forecasters are exposed to some products uh, that are related to hail. Uh, they are single polarization only, so they have their limitations. And they're mostly used for situational awareness, so real time, what is happening now um, and today. Also, there's grid-based products. Uh, the Rainfield Suite, it's the suite of uh, software we have for, uh, for, for, for rainfall. It produces an instantaneous uh, mesh. Mesh means maximum, uh, maximum expected size of hail, which is a size estimate, the probability of severe hail, a severe hail index, and some accumulations as well. It's important to know how things have accumulated in the past, uh, say, one hour or one and a half hours. And that's available for sites and for mosaic domains uh, at the moment. And there are also some tools that exist that are running operationally at the Bureau called WIDS and Titan. And they produce those maximum uh, cell-based uh, follow-up of what mesh and, 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 and uh, probability of severe hail uh, is doing. The main limitations is that as, as we try to illustrate on this plot on the right, this mesh is estimated from things that are happening aloft. So in basically in that column above the freezing level. And so you're trying to sort out from uh, integration of reflectivity what your hail size aloft is. And then the main assumption that you do is that you just say, well, it's falling there at ground. But uh, it means that you're actually underestimating or not taken, taking into account any circulation inside the, as, as the hailstone goes down, there's no horizontal advection. And it's very common, um, where Rob Warren, for instance, has shown very clearly some shifts, systematic shifts. So when you send emergency services, for instance, after that has happened and you say, well, the damage has happened here, but it actually happened five kilometers away from there. That's, that's sort of a failure. So we try to, one of the motivations is to try to improve that. And uh, in terms of current services, there's no hail now casting. There's just manual extrapolation is made by the forecasters using cell-based mesh uh, to try to generate warnings. So our objectives are simple and you can guess what they are. Uh, first thing, we need to improve hail size and the SWAT mapping using new, new Doppler and the dual pole capabilities. Uh, so that all brings together everything we're trying to do pretty much. By using the Doppler, you get the 3D wind circulation inside the storm. And from those circulations, you can take into account 
the horizontal advection and 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 and, um, and vertical advection as well of uh, inside those health cores. We want to develop also another thing that is not provided at the moment. There's a, another type of um, hazard that is produced by hail is when you have very large accumulation of small hail. That's another issue. If it accumulates over warehouse roofs, for instance, the roof can collapse much more than you if you have a few big hailstones that are falling over uh, warehouse roofs. So that's, we're trying to provide the diagnostics of large accumulation of small hail called LASH. I know there's a lot of acronyms to take in and develop this hail now casting service that doesn't exist at the moment. And um, we have started with a single polarization first because of course we don't have dual polarization everywhere. So I think that the idea is to get a baseline service from single polarization observations. And we've had support from industry. So Perils, which is an NGO um, based in Switzerland that provide uh, information to the insurance company about uh, losses associated with high-end storms. Uh, we've developed this national mosaic of uh, accumulated mesh, uh, which is corrected for a cell advection and that ingests the radar calibration uh, that we do daily uh, that I've presented uh, earlier in that. Uh, so as you can see, things are coming together. Um, it's designed to support health impact mapping and verification. And uh, what we've done is to provide a prototype. It's not operational yet, but we've provided a prototype to get feedbacks to eight private companies from the insurance, reinsurance, and energy sectors. Uh, and so that first we raise awareness that this is coming and also to receive feedbacks. Does it match their expectations? Is it useful for them? What should we do differently? And so on. So there's a whole, uh, it's a whole dimension in this public services transformation project to do that sort of, uh, of things. In terms of hail now casting, just a few words, we are gonna start with a version one again, start simple and then improve. We just advex specially the analysis of hail size that I showed you earlier, both single pole but also dual polarization, without attempting to now cast the internal evolution. That's of course a very strong limitation because the time scale of, uh, of hail growth and hail fall uh, is very <laughs> quick, um, but it's probably good enough to characterize track, but not intensity. In, in version two, and that's probably something of interest to this group. If anyone got uh, interested in this, there's a lot of research to do to understand the life cycle of hail cells. And from this uh, composite life cycle of hail cell we want to build, we would be able to now cast the internal evolution in the next step. And then this is just a short schematics and that's probably yeah, my last, before, yeah, last or one before last. Uh, that's the work that uh, Jordan Brook is doing uh, at University of Queensland uh, for his PhD. It's, it's called HailTrack. It already exists, but only one version of it. What we're trying to do here is to use single or dual, polar, dual Doppler 3 winds. Those are three ingredients you need. The single or dual polarization hail detection aloft, as I showed you, you, the first thing you do is you detect it aloft. And then you try to attribute a size for hailstones aloft. Once you have that, you have all the ingredients to do trajectory analysis, individual trajectory analysis, so that you can predict where and when hail is going to reach the ground. Um, so of course, we're expecting short lead times. The typical lead time, we've looked at, at that a little bit, is about 10 minutes. But when we spoke to, to the different uh, industry sectors, they said, well, anything we can get, because we have nothing at the moment, is useful. For instance, you could imagine that uh, they can develop a service uh, through mobile phones where you say, well, this is where hail is going to hit. Hide your cars or put your car underneath if you want to get rid of it. Um, and, uh, and that's the sort of applications for very short lead times. We are also planning to do a lot of research to try to predict hail growth so that you can have a little bit more lead time uh, in the future. So that's a very nice schematics that uh, John had, Jordan has done to illustrate that when you have the hail core here, it's not falling vertically, it's falling and that's an illustration for this famous Brisbane hailstorm from 2014, where uh, when you were making that assumption, all the hail was falling here, but actually it, it fell here. That's the hail swath that we ended up uh, finding. That's uh, to illustrate uh, interactions we have with the insurance industry, uh, IAG uh, and Suncorp, uh, especially they have provided uh, through different projects, some insurance claims from which you can get some reference. That's uh, the, that's work that ha had been done by uh, Rob Warren, again, uh, in a really nice paper you should look up uh, from last year, I think, or two years ago. And so the white areas is where you don't have any insured people. The, 
light, uh, I don't know, salmon color is where you have insurance people, but you don't have any report. And the red areas is where the, 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 the claims have happened. And the, 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 the rectangles that you see here is where our hail swath is located with, with hail track. So you see pretty good performance. We are covering most of this hail area at very uh, small, uh, with, with very high accuracy. And just to show the step jump in accuracy you can get, uh, that's uh, this, uh, it's called, a, yeah, it's the success ratio here. So one minus the false alarm ratio versus the probability of detection. Where you want to be is here in that plot. This is what you get when you do mesh, uh, the single polarization, no advection. And this is what you get uh, when, you, when you use HailTrack, which is our new tool. So you really, it, it's hard to gain a lot in, in this critical success index. Uh, and here it's, it's really a step jump. So we are, we're really hopeful that we're going to do a good job with that. The last thing I want to say uh, is uh, make some uh, pitch for two important things that my team is developing as well. Uh, some of you may be aware of that because it's been used in Plex. Um, uh, it's the Open Weather Radar Archive. So what we are trying to do here is to get uh, on NCI a historical, uh, the best possible database of historical radar observations from the operational radar net network. At the moment, you only have uh, some of the possible products, but we are working towards producing gridded products, for some of the radars, you have 20 years plus of observations. So for any work about rainfall extremes or hail or any sort of uh, things that require a radar, this is an invaluable resource. And we really want to get your feedbacks as well on, on what you would like to see there or if you have any issues when you're using the data. Because there's a, there's, there's, there's a lot of data, so it's, sometimes it's hard to pick when things are not working. But so I, I've provided you here the address if you want to, to look at this. Um, it's going to be upgraded with a dual polarization uh, radar observations and importantly something that had not been done before we are going to bring the national mosaic i was showing you of rainfall we're going to provide that in the in the nci archive as well uh, probably yeah by uh, one or two months maybe ago there's lots to to sort out about licensing and so on and the other thing is the webex application so it's a mobile app for you to report uh, four types of hazards, so hail, uh, flood, wind, and tornado. For us, it's invaluable because if you, if you have that sort of um, validation, even if it's points, it's very useful. And it's also very useful for forecasters because they, they need to build confidence that something, oh, indeed has happened. And what they're doing at the moment, they're just scoring through Facebook and the social media to find any sort of evidence that, uh, that there has been uh, things happening uh, where they think uh, things are about to happen. So the WebEx app is a, so it's a citizen app and I really encourage you to download it in your, uh, in your phone and anytime you're exposed to hazards to report it. I think I'm gonna end there and thank you for your attention. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Elaine. I'm sure everybody's clapping their hands. <laughs> It's a bit hard on Zoom, isn't it? Uh, look, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, would you like me to read them out to you or are you able to see the box there and answer them yourself? What would you prefer that I do? Um, so I should open the q and I guess. Yeah, if you just look at the Q&A box, you'll see. So there's that. Bruce. Yep. How are you planning to, hi Bruce. How are you planning to deliver the alerts to the public with minimum delays given the, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really important question. So that's probably the hottest question at the moment at the Bureau. There are, um, Initially, in the public services transformation program, and it's actually critical for us as well because we are not in charge of that. We are producing data layers, and this needs to be ingested in a system. And um, so they have designed something called the Australian Safety and Alerting Program. The idea is to bring all the different hazards together in one single platform for the forecasters to issue warnings. That's the future. It's, it's, it hasn't happened yet. As always, there's discussion about uh, do we go with something that's already off the shelf and implement it, or do we try to beat this internally? I think they're going to go with uh, something off the shelf, but I'm not sure that there's actually anything that exists. That, and, and that should also reduce the latency as well. That's the objective. I hope I answered your question. Is it also oh, Hamish? Hello, Hamish. Is it possible to estimate the growth rate of hail using dual pole data? So, 
it's 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 tricky. Uh, it it needs to be done through a combination of uh, observations and modeling. Uh, there are tools we are working. Um, well, Joshua especially is working with Matt Kungjan, who's uh, running very high resolution. Uh, uh, I think it's called CM1, the model, uh, to try to learn about hail growth. Uh, there are some parameterizations that can be uh, informed by dual pole observations. That's, that's, where, that's, that's what we are trying to do. And um, we have been involved in the design of a new NSF experiment in the US called ICECHIP. I like the acronym, so I can't help uh, telling it, um, which should happen in 2023, 2024 in two phases, where one of the targets is actually to learn about hail growth in, uh, in hail uh, storms. Steve, what methods are being explored at the Bureau to predict over a few hour lead time the evolution of hail or rain features? Through machine learning use of forecast met fields. Yeah, so for rain, uh, for well, for, 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 for rain, we have this steps technique. I don't think we we have some uh, work we are doing with the research branch of IAG. Uh, we haven't spoken much with them, but the idea was to do exactly what you say, Steve, uh, develop machine learning tools to, to train um, and find the best solution. So it's, it's not a physically based uh, thing. It's purely a machine learning based. It had modest success so far, but uh, there are other examples uh, in the US and Europe where it's a bit more promising. So that's definitely something that uh, is being explored internationally. Uh, I don't know that we have very strong plans to do that. And for hail, uh, I would see um, what I was mentioning, trying to build a composite uh, life uh, cycle of hail uh, cells would be done with machine learning approaches. But uh, the issue with hail, of course, is the number of samples you can get. and uh, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's mainly the challenge, I think. But that's probably the only solution. I don't know if you have any follow-up questions, of course, uh, please feel free to send again. So, Bruce, for Perth, the Sampletine radar has a poor view to the northwest. Oh, don't tell me about it. From the cold east type of wind. Are there plans to use 10 minute TMRA data to supplement the radar? Oh, well, you're touching something close to my heart, Bruce. Um, at the Bureau recently, we had this uh, exercise called the Innovation Framework, and the idea is quite, was quite interesting and very new for the Bureau, actually, if I may. Um, they were asking people to propose ideas, uh, and then if your idea was selected, uh, you would um, have four, five days to work full time on exploring these ideas. And the focus this time was on machine learning. And so what we've proposed in my team was to try to produce synthetic radar reflectivities out of HIMA variate and lightning observation. And in four days, uh, so Valentin developed that uh, in my team, and it's amazing, it's, it's, it's actually possible. <laughs> uh, that, that came from a, a paper we read, uh, someone was doing that in the US, and uh, that could be one way, where you actually produce false radar observations nationally from the HIMA variate and uh, and, and lightning observations. And one more step for that could be to do that by using BARA analysis as well, so that you get some idea of the large scale uh, context, because the large scale context, of course, is going to uh, be more or less conducive to different sorts of uh, reflectivity. So that's, that's, that's something we want to explore next. Uh, we are looking for uh, internal funding to develop that idea further. Maxime. Uh, are using Lagrangian like computations of hailstones a lot to make the three into two accounts? Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, I will point you to, uh, I can send you, Maxime, uh, the paper has just been published. I can send you, you will have all the details uh, in, in the hail track paper. Annabelle, are there any plans to adjust estimated rain rate data in the operator to account for hail? Um, well, for single pole radars, as I said, there's not too much we can do. The best we can do, uh, and actually we don't really need to do it, you just need to know about it. If reflectivities exceed 55 dBz, there's a high chance that uh, you're gonna have hail. So you can design your own, uh, your own um, filter to say, well, I think that's hail or I think that's not hail. 
for dual polarization, definitely uh, in the longer term in the Open Radar Archive, all the dual polarization products that we will uh, devise uh, operationally, the plan will be to to have with some delay the same uh, outputs in the National Radar Archive. Pete was mentioning, uh, so, yeah, well, was replying to. Um, Yeah, I was replying to Steve's question around uh, looking at very high resolution modeling, improved DA. So yeah, Craig and Nathan are working on that. And uh, we are actually super interested in collaborating more with you, Craig and Nathan, around that. Because that's the scale we're really interested in. Bruce, are there plans to try a bi-static sensors to supplement the Doppler radar? Well, that's even closer to my heart. I didn't want to mention that because I, I feel that I'm boring people with this idea, <laughs> but uh, that's definitely in the cards. So the status of that is uh, at um, uh, University of Oklahoma. They have this Advanced Research uh, Radar Research Center, ARC, and uh, I'm in a discussion with them to develop a test bed where we would bring uh, bi-static uh, receivers uh, around one of our radars, can be Melbourne, can be Sydney, uh, to, to demonstrate uh, the added value of that. Just for people who are not familiar with bi-static sensors, which probably 99% of uh, people here, it's a bit like having one receiver of the radar, but not at the radar location, at another location. So when you have that, you can actually uh, get another non-collinear view and very cheaply. Uh, the systems that uh, the ARC uh, is working on cost $5,000 US. So the idea is develop two or three of them, deploy two or three of them around, uh, starting with major uh, capital cities probably. But first, I think we need to demonstrate uh, the, the, the added value of those. And it's quite incredible, really. OK, has anybody got any more questions? Okay. Uh, I actually have one question, Elaine, if that's okay to ask Please you. Do. Of Just course. Just in the, uh, the verification of your, you showed a picture of a, the tornado track over Sydney and that kind of bottom yep. of the area. I mean, how does that go in areas where things aren't well observed? Does it tend to overwarn for tornadoes or is this, is this a, a kind of new thing that the Bureau... Yeah, no, tornadoes, yeah tornadoes is a... Uh, not even it doesn't even show at once we do those 3d uh, what you've seen this animation is really the mesocyclone that you're that you're resolving but then you have all the ingredients that will tell you uh, that there's the potential for the development of tornado but i would say that unless you look at the raw observations and and that's what forecasters are doing actually they're looking at the raw doppler observations to look for cyclonic and cyclonic circ circulation and say oh well i think there's a tornado here but even at the na native resolution if you think it's 250 meter, the scale of a tornado can be less than that. So you can even not detect it at all. So the strategy, and, and, and there are things uh, at the Bureau that develop what's called the convective outlooks. Uh, it's trying to predict uh, the large scale conditions conducive to tornado and produce uh, warnings where they think there's a risk for tornado. But that's, that's kind of the best we can do. Uh, we don't even try it with the radars honest. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I think Craig Bishop might have a question. He's a panelist, so unfortunately we can't use the Q&A. Craig, did you want to unmute yourself and ask? ask yes. Him? Hello, Alain. Thank you. That Hello, was Craig. a super interesting talk. I just wanted to ask um, if you could share any insights you have. I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a radar ignoramus, but um, often in radar images, you see these radial bands you know, like coming out from the center. You, you are in some of yeah. your figures, you can mm -hmm. see the radial bands. And um, what, what is causing those? Why are they there? Are they there all the time? Do they appear in random locations? Do they tend to appear in the same location all the time? This is sort of an interesting yeah. example of correlated observation error as a data. Yeah, so that's, uh, it's, kind of there are, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if you, so you said you have seen some here. Uh, yeah, uh, it was like uh, midway through the talk. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a little yeah, no. bit. There. No, it would be nice. Oh, there was a better one, though. There was a better one earlier, not there. Is it be? No. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Well, right here, oh, you yeah. see here? Yeah, all those. You got so, all these. So, so, so there's, there's different things. It can be uh, probably four or five things. There are things we can correct easily. So this thing you see here, for instance, this white area, is because there has been an interference from another uh, radio frequency source. And it produces those rings of basically constant reflectivity. This is something we can pick very easily and, and correct. But of course, when you do that, you've got a gap here. And this gap is not real. It's just that we can't get the signal here because there's a gap. The other possibility is when you have interference, so you hit the sun, and the sun is going to show all along the radial as well. We actually use that for uh, the calibration. That's another possibility. This is different. This, uh, what you see here, those rings here, or the, those rays, sorry, it's attenuation. So uh, probably from that uh, cell over here, it's about 50 dBz. Even at that frequency, you can have uh, attenuation. So this has not been corrected here. We actually have plans to correct. It's, it's not so much of a problem as been except when you have hail. Uh, and in that case, we need to, to find solutions to correct for attenuation. So what, what usually we can do is recover what the signal should be in those areas here. Uh, and at C band, it's dramatic. There's a, the, it, it's, it's a lot more prominent, but that is due to uh, hydrometer attenuation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, you were you mentioned uh, radar frequencies that interfere. Is that sort of? Do you know about most of those? And are they normally like stationary locations of radar interference, no, or is it just no, someone with their iPhone? Yeah, exactly. Or, it's, right, sort of oh it's sort of random. It's sort of random. Yeah, yeah. It's sort right. of random, and that's why. But 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 we we can pick those and correct for those uh, quite efficiently. In in data assimilation, we often try and use the most sophisticated forward models we can, and so a good forward model would be one that had attenuation in it. So do you guys have Absolutely. any models like that that would sort of predict that? Because we wouldn't really call that an observation error. You know, if it's like attenuation that we can model, then... Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, more, it's, it's, it's more in the forward modeling space. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there are... Yeah. There are, there are uh, if you have a single polarization radar, again, you're very limited in what you can do. But basically, you have iterative procedure along the range where you correct using the reflectivity that you have. Because for a given... There's a power law between attenuation and reflectivity. That's the sort of thing you can do to correct for most of the effect. Of course, sometimes you have full attenuation, full extinction of the signal. In that case, you can't recover the signal. So that will introduce errors because there is actually something in the atmosphere. But if you're assimilating that, you will assimilate nothing in that area. But I think that's probably a minor problem compared to having a at least the signal you have in the right place through assimilation. That's all. All right. I think thanks thank so much. For, we're we're running out of time. Um, yep. just, a, just a quick reminder for the ECRs who are still in the room that you have a Q&A session with Alain um, right now. Um, well, in a minute. So uh, when you leave here, you can sign into the ECR Zoom room uh, that should have been sent to you via email. Um, if you haven't received that, you can uh, contact Nathan Eisenberg, but he'll be there in a minute. Um, we have one more minute, so we probably have time for one more question, Malan. Uh, again, from Bruce Buckley in the Q&A box, if you're able to see that, if you could just answer that quickly, and then we might uh, draw it to a close. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, so thanks to your contacts, uh, Bruce, uh, we have been uh, contacted by uh, someone uh, who's in charge of this uh, weather today or weather something a project um, he said that he would gather his team that they were mostly on holidays but uh, gather his team and organize for a chat so yes this is a uh, and thanks a lot for making that connection because I think there's a there's some potential here they seem to be really interested all right well thank you very much and thank you very much uh, much to everybody for, for asking such wonderful questions and a big thank you to Anna for coming and speaking to us today it was a really really interesting talk um, and you know I think a lot of us use the bureau radar every day and you know we well if you're anything like me you know very little about uh, you know the, the specifics so it was really great to hear that today so thank you very much Thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, there will be another one of these same time next month. And again, uh, for those ECRs in the room, uh, please head over to the Zoom room now where you can have a chat to Alain about his career path and anything else you might want to talk about. So thanks everybody for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. See you next time.